Hi, my name is John Hirschman from GLJ. Today, we're going to be talking about geothermal and the geothermal potential in historic oil and gas fields. First, we're going to define what geothermal is and geothermal uses. We're going to go through a really brief introduction of understanding what geothermal is, their geological settings, the extraction technology, and the type of power plants. Then, we're going to go into looking at at the potential in the Western Canadian sedimentary basin. And then we're going to use an example of how we can calculate heat in place and energy utilization of the geothermal resources. Geothermal is defined as thermal energy extracted from the earth. Most common use is electricity and residential heating. However, there are many uses for geothermal. From agricultural to food processing and industrial uses, geothermal can provide clean, reliable heat to these industries. Many applications of geothermal heat don't require very hot temperatures, such as agriculture only needs temperatures in the 40, 50 degree range to heat greenhouses for growing. First, we're gonna understand what geothermal energy is. We're gonna look at the geological settings, the extraction types of technologies, as well as geothermal power plant. First, we're gonna look at the different types of geological settings. The first setting is sedimentary basins, where we host most oil and gas reserves. The second is hydrothermal or volcanic, and the third is hot and deep systems. The geological setting that we're really gonna focus on today is the sedimentary basins. These are very common for geothermal resources because they're found everywhere in the world. Unfortunately, due to them, they have lower temperature than hydrothermal systems. So there isn't as much power generated for them due to the lower temperature. In sedimentary basins, it's pretty easy to understand what temperature you're going to reach due to a geothermal gradient. The deeper you go, the hotter it gets. So to understand it, we need to understand how deep we have to drill and what the geothermal gradient is. The most developed geothermal setting is hydrothermal or volcanic systems. These hydrothermal systems target hot reservoirs proximal to volcanoes. They use hot geothermal fluids, which have been heated by being in close proximity to volcanic areas. Historically, they've been the most common type of geothermal system because of their very high temperatures at a relatively shallow depth that allows for substantial power generating capacities. Hydrothermal volcanic geothermal systems harvest water or steam in the country rock which is proximal to these volcanoes. The geothermal reservoirs in this country rock are composed of either sedimentary, fractured igneous or metamorphic rocks and are located usually in fault zones. An optimal geothermal reservoir, unfortunately in this, is situated far enough away from this magma chamber to avoid the considerable number of technical challenges with drilling these wells, but close enough to provide high enough temperatures for geothermal resources. The third type of geological setting, if we can call it a geological setting, is hot and deep systems. With these, they're targeting hot, deep type rock. This could be basement igneous rock, metamorphic rock, or hot, deep, tight strata. What they're wanting to do is target fractures in the rock or stimulate fractures in the rock to produce water through these fractures from the injector well all the way through these fractures while it's heating up to the production well. So again, we can look at three different types of things for geothermal extraction technologies. We have conventional geothermal, enhanced geothermal systems, EGS, advanced geothermal systems, AGS. So the first one we're going to look at is conventional geothermal. With conventional geothermal, two wells are drilled into a hot permeable reservoir. These are also commonly known as doublets. One of the wells, the producer, pumps hot water brine to the surface. It then goes into your surface facility, it could be a power plant, thermal energy production, and then the cooled water is pumped back into ground as an injector. The second type of system, which is getting more and more to the forefront these days, is enhanced geothermal systems. With these systems, we drill into hot basement rock or volcanic rock or hot sedimentary rock deep underground. Um, with these on the right, image on the right, cold water is pumped down into this rock, into the fractures, to open these fractures and create a thing called hydro shearing. So artificially stimulating these fractures with cold water. These fractures, the water flows through these fractures to the producer well, and that hot water then comes to the surface. Another one, how of EGS, is enhanced geothermal systems using hydraulic fracturing. With this, we're drilling horizontal wells like oil and gas, stimulate the wells with hydraulic fracturing, have injection producer combination pairs to inject and produce cold and hot water. The third type of system caught out there right now is called advanced geothermal systems. This is a lot different compared to conventional or enhanced geothermal systems because instead of using 
convection, they're using conduction to heat fluid in the well bores. So with this, they're pumping fluid down through the well bores. That fluid in the well bore gets heated up like a radiator and comes back up to surface. A common one right now you know, that's based out of Alberta is called Ever Technologies. Ever is piloting a project right now in Alberta um, near Rocky Mountain House, and they're trying to develop this technology worldwide. Again, keeping with this rule of three, we have three different geothermal power plant types too. We have flash steam, which uses a combination of steam and water with temperatures probably usually above about 200 degrees Celsius. We have dry steam, which only uses steam into the processing. So it's producing steam directly from the ground, which has really high temperatures close to volcanic settings usually, which have temperatures between 100, 240 and 300 degrees Celsius. And then the last type, and which is becoming more and more common are binary cycles, which can utilize temperatures as low as 60 degrees Celsius. These use water only. So this can be common in oil and gas co-generation and very common in sedimentary basins. So the hot water in this comes to surface, goes into a heat exchanger, and that heat exchanger vaporizes some kind of isobutane or an alcohol that which is then used into the turbine. So to summarize our geothermal energy, we can really plot it onto one plot. We can do a temperature versus depth. So in this plot, we have our different geological settings. We have sedimentary basins, our hydrothermal volcanic systems, as well as hot and deep systems. And we can plot what type of plants can be used in it and how they kind of fit in the spectrum for our geothermal gradient. So circled on this plot, we have sedimentary basins. They have a lower geothermal gradient than our volcanic systems and have a, a greater depth. So we can see kind of where they relate in combination to these other different geothermal systems. So now we're going to take a look at the geothermal potential in the Western Canadian sedimentary basin. To assess the geothermal potential in the Western Canadian sedimentary basin or any sedimentary basin, we need to understand what the geothermal gradient across the basin is. We can easily calculate this using bottom hole temperatures or test data such as DSTs or flow pressure tests. Um, we can take this temperature that we have down hole and at a certain depth and calculate a geothermal gradient. The geothermal gradient is easily defined as temperature at depth minus temperature at surface divided by the true vertical depth. So once we have a geothermal gradient, we can multiply this by a true vertical depth to get our predicted temperature at depth. So on the image on the right here, we have the predicted temperature at the top of the Precambrian Basin and in the Western Canadian Sedimentary Basin. So instead of taking the temperature of the basement, we can also take the temperature at a formation top. So taking a map to the true vertical depth to the top of formation, we can understand the potential of that formation. So what we did here is we took the top of the Leduc formation. Since it's a prolific reservoir in Alberta, it's common to have EOR schemes in it, as well as it has a strong water lake. So what we ended up doing is taking that geothermal gradient multiplied by their true vertical depth to the top of the Leduc, and we ended up getting the temperature at the top of the Leduc formation across Alberta. We can also look at what kind of production is actually coming out of our sedimentary basin from oil and gas activities. So we pulled the production data from public sources such as GeoScout and AccuMap and utilized our temperature mappings or geothermal gradient and our depth down to those formations to understand what kind of temperature is at that formation or where that their perfs are in these wells to understand how hot this water is coming to surface. So taking the temperature multiplied by the volume, we can understand how much energy will be coming out of the ground for each one of these wells. So in Alberta, central Alberta here, we can understand that there's some areas that have some high thermal energy production, such as Swan Hills, the Pembina Field, Redwater, up in the Grand Prairie area, and even in the Leduc Reef trend close to Edmonton. We first need to understand heat in place underground. So we can do this using a heat in place and calculation to understand what kind of energy is available in the system. So what we're going to do is try to calculate heat in place underground. So the calculation used to calculate heat in place is very similar to calculating hydrocarbons underground, such as oil in place or gas in place. Instead, we're going to calculate thermal energy in place. For this calculation, we need to understand our volume of rock. So we need to understand what is a rock volume as well as our fluid volume. From that, we need to multiply on our specific heat capacity of the rock and fluid, as well as a change in temperature. So the change in our reservoir temperature to the change in our reinjection temperature. So once we have that heat in place, we then can put a recovery factor on it. So just like oil and gas is what's 
are in place times by recovery factor equals recoverable thermal energy. We can estimate this. There's a few different ways that have been published over the past, but a simple one on the bottom equation here um, is just a difference between the temperature of our reservoir um, versus their minimum temperature of a facility. So in published values, they're usually quoting between 10 and 25% for sedimentary rocks for conventional geothermal using a producer injector well doublet pairs. So we're going to do an example calculation of this heat in place. So I mentioned before the EGS of using horizontal well. So we're going to look at that as an example because we can get so much more production of a horizontal well compared to a vertical well. So if we look at an example of two pads, um, about 1,200 meters wide, 3,500 um, meter horizontals, and 100 meter thick reservoir, we can multiply that to calculate our net rock volume. We can also calculate using our net fluid volume if we know our porosity. And we can use some generic values for specific heat capacity of rock as well as specific heat capacity of the fluid. Our temperature we can predict, so let's say it's 130 degrees. We're going to re-inject it after it comes out of the plant at 60 degrees. And our minimum re our temperature coming out of the plant is 100 degrees to actually plant utilization. So calculating that all through, dividing it by time of 30 years, we, that estimates for these two pads is about 21 megawatts of thermal energy over 30 years. That is using a recovery factor of 15% based off of conventional vertical wells. As I mentioned before, we're going to look at an enhanced geothermal system using horizontal well bores and hydraulic fracturing to understand how we can, how much energy we can produce rather than just looking at conventional vertical producers. So what we did was we decided to use an injector producer combination. So producer, injector, producer, injector, producer for this one pad that you see here. We're, as of our heat in place calculation, we ended up using two pads, but just imagine another pad to the south of that or next to it. So what we assumed was that water is injected into our injectors and it disperses equally to the left and right of the producer or the injector to the producers. So this would ends up with having a half pattern wells. So producers that only have about 10,000 barrels out of it coming out of a day and full pattern wells, which have flow from two injectors, which have 20,000 barrels per day. So what we're, we're assuming, like I said, we're assuming that these wells will be stimulated. They'll be stimulated somehow like using an acid wash or acid frack or slick water fracturing. Um, as the injector and producers are parallel to each other, we can really model this pretty easily um, using Excel even to understand the temperature changes throughout the reservoir. So we're going to look at how we actually can thermal model the temperature going from the injector to the producer. So ideally, everything will work like a piston. You put cold water in, it pushes that cold hot water out to your producer and eventually your whole rock becomes uniformly cold. But unfortunately that isn't the case in reality. So more specifically, we ended up using a 1D convective use model. So with this model, we're trying to understand how that water actually disperses within that reservoir and heats up while it's moving across the flood front from the injector to the producer. So these types of models were first established back in the 50s for like solvent flooding applications. So we took these solvent flooding applications, converted it to thermal models, and we're looking at how that hot water disperses across the reservoir. Real reservoirs are not homogeneous in both vertical and horizontal dimensions. So we really need to look at how stuff is in real life. We can't just say this is a 100% sweep efficiency over time everything will be drained out. We know that's not the case. There's changes in permeability, porosity, there could be natural fractions bringing within the system, and we're gonna get variable rates of fluid moving across both vertically and horizontally across um, our reservoir. So we need to take into account some kind of sweep efficiency to understand how this hot water or cold water front moves across to the producer well. So the displacement water model we use uses the same inputs of their heat in place modeling for aerial size or temperature, the specific heat capacities and densities of the rock, porosity of the rock, but there's still a lot of unknowns that we don't know and there's a high degree of uncertainty. We don't understand yet what dispersion coefficient can be in a system, how good the sweep efficiency is of these horizontal wells. So what we ended up doing was creating a Monte Carlo simulation to take all of this data and a large degree of uncertainty on this data to understand how we can actually, how much energy is going to be pulled out of the ground over 30 years. So 
what we ended up doing is putting this into a Monte Carlo simulation. We ran a 1D displacement model, as we mentioned before, and we ended up calculating with how the temperature and the output of the well, the end of that horizontal, changes over time. So unsurprisingly, to push that first hot water out of the reservoir, we have pretty much flat temperature for the first few years of the reservoir and few first few years of production. After time, we start seeing a decrease in temperature, pretty much like you would see in oil and gas with a decline curve. So what we ended up calculating was about 20 to 30 percent recovery factor from the reservoir using the EGS system. So a lot more than what we get from the vertical uh, wells um, from literature of that 10 to 25 percent. So the horizontal wells, unsurprisingly, are more efficient of draining the reservoir than vertical wells. So this really aligns with um, the rule of thumb that's in literature from verticals, and since we're a little bit higher since we're using horizontal. So we're pretty confident in our model to say how the temperature behaves over time, flat for a while and then declines. So we're not gonna get that kind of temperature out of the reservoir. We know we're gonna lose some te temperature due to the vertical well bore. So going from the horizontal section up to surface. So what we end up doing was creating using the line source model from Ramey in 1962 is a very well understood and used um, model for uh, heat transfer. So with this, what it really is doing is heat is conducting from that well bore to this cool rock around it. So what we end up saying there's heat loss in early times, but as the production time goes on, the proximal rock around that well bore is already started he heating. So early on the models that we were calculating have about 10 degrees Celsius temperature loss. And over time, that decreases about five degrees Celsius. So with our well design, we had multiple different half pattern producers and full pattern producers. So with our six producers we had in our system, it pr we, for this example, we said we'll produce about 80,000 barrels a day with and inject 80,000 barrels a day. So calculating how much energy or how our temperature is coming to surface, we can take what's coming out of the ground and also how much is lost in the vertical well bore. So adding it all together, our pad surface temperature at surface is about 120 degrees, 125 degrees at the beginning of time. And our reservoir temperature is about 130 degrees. So we lost a bit of temperature um, due to the vertical well bore. But Temperature is not what we really want to know. We want to know how much energy is coming out of the ground. So we can calculate either thermal energy or electrical energy. So our thermal energy is pretty easily calculated. So we're just looking at our density of our fluid times by our specific heat capacity of fluid multiplied by our flow rate that's coming to the surface and times it by a change in temperature. So what temperature do we have coming out of the ground minus the temperature out of the plant or out of our use case in this example. So on the graph on the top left there is showing how much thermal energy is coming out of the ground from these two pads. So we're calculating about 35 megawatts of thermal energy coming to the surface. And easily to calculate electrical energy, we just take that thermal energy and times it by an electrical utilization factor. So in this case, our electrical utilization factor is anywhere between about 12 and 15 percent. So we multiply that um, electrical utilization factor by our thermal energy to get our gross electrical energy for the pad. So for this example, we're sitting at a rope, five megawatts of energy coming to surface of electrical energy. Geothermal energy is an underutilized resource which has potential for base load power and heat. Sedimentary reservoirs, particularly the water lake and old abandoned fields can allow for geothermal production. Technological advancements for horizontal wells from oil and gas can allow for the ability to produce more geothermal energy at a cost reduction. This will allow for access to more geothermal resources worldwide and bring geothermal energy to the forefront of the energy transition. So thanks for listening. My name is John Hirschmiller again. Please reach out if you have any questions. I'll be happy to answer them. Thanks.